Hey everybody, this is Polly Trailer. I'm with OpsRamp. Welcome to our Ramp Chat today. Um, we are gonna be talking about continuous integration and continuous delivery today. And I'm very happy to have our group product manager from OpsRamp, Michael Fisher, on board with us. Michael has a lot of in-depth experience in this topic. We're gonna be talking about, generally speaking, um, what is CICD transformation and what have we experienced in our journey in, in changing our software development practices, why we did that, what are some of the tools and processes that we used that were helpful, what were some things that went wrong, and Michael's going to end up with a few tips to uh, help your organization if you happen to be just starting on the journey or maybe stuck. And also, um, please do keep in mind that we will have time at the end for Q&A. You can submit your question in the question tool in Bright Talk, and um, so please do that, and I'd love to go ahead and, and bring up Michael on the live video. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Paul, I think you have me on. Good to see you. Yeah, nice so, to see you as well. You're in beautiful uh, Ventura, California, right? I am. It's a little chilly out, so I have the jacket on, but uh, us Southern California aren't as resilient to cold weather as the Colorado <laughs> people, so we got to stay warm. I know. Right. So I'm in Denver, <laughs> and it is actually really nice. We're having Indian summer here, so. Um, but I, I lived in your freezing area at one point in my life, so I understand your pain. <laughs> so um, anyhow, but... Um, Great. So just a quick uh, update. OpsRamp is an IT infrastructure discovery and monitoring platform powered by artificial intelligence. In case you don't know us, that's who we are, what we do. But um, we're not going to be talking about products so much today, but more about how to build product. Right, Michael? Yeah, and, you know, build, exactly. build products better. Um, and, and so just for context, can you just walk us through a little bit about what does our development organization look like? How is it structured? Where are where are our people? I think they're in a lot of different places, so um, share that, would you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So OpsRamp, like many modern SaaS companies, we have a global um, distribution of team, and especially with COVID, we have the entire team working from home. So we're delivering software, creating software, all from the, you know, our home offices. So most of our development efforts are coming out of the India, out of India. We have two offices in India with some of our um, UI UX work coming out of the San Jose office. So um, it is a distributed team. And so managing a distributed team and it has its own challenges. But in terms of headcount, we have probably close to, you know, let's say north of 150 to 175 developers right now, um, you know, across India and the U.S. Um, and that's not and that's that's including, you know, the, the engineering managers and the developers underneath them and, and, the, and the UI UX uh, designers. Yes. OK, very good. Thank you. Um, before we get into our story and um, what we've been doing, can you just give us a little bit of insight into what we mean when we say a CICD journey? What does that entail, I guess, generally? Yeah, so I think this is kind of a big a big term that's been thrown around in the industry. Generally, when I refer to this, and I, I come at this with a product lens, and I think you know some of the different lens on the topic might come a little differently, but to me, transitioning to a CICD process has many different components to it. Um, some of them... in you know, or include, you know, adhering to a more agile process, include, you know, increasing the automation coverage, including, you know, the more monitoring of your services you're delivering. But ultimately, it's really about delivering software to your customers faster and with more stability, because at the end of the day, that's what all software companies are trying to do. And the process is just a vehicle to get there. And so to me, that's really what it means to offer as an organization. Very good. OK, so let's go back a little bit in time and, and talk about where we used to be um when that was and why we decided it was time for a change yep yeah so we've had a pretty similar you know looking back let's say since the founding in 2014 the model stayed pretty consistent you know it's been i would say a hybrid between agile and waterfall approach um so we have these quarterly releases that we've been doing for a long time these are the large platform releases where we have all the features that are expected by the product manager or the product team come to fruition at the end of the quarter and so we've been doing this process for the last, say, three years. Um, recently, we kind of introduced a more, let's say, modern and automated approach, and we've included a weekly hotfix. And so that's for small bug fixes um, and more smaller changes that aren't heavy impacting on the UI. Um, and so kind of the transition process came to the realization is that you know, when you have so much in progress during a certain time frame, you know, we have close to 80 features that are being worked on over a 33-month period. And if you're culminating those at the very end, let's say you have a month, that means you have only a month to test 80 features working compatibly, working in conjunction with each other in the same code base in the same build pipeline. So that creates a lot of issues for QA, for PM, uh, our SE team that needs to test. Um, and 
when you have just so much in progress over that time frame as well, you really can't validate how it's going to interact or how it's going to you know, behave with other features because they're not ready. And so the realization we had is, you know, if we want to get to the state where we can release faster with more agility and more st you know, and more stable for our customers, then we have to reduce our work in progress. And so that was really the problem we looked to solve. We said, okay, well, how do we do that? How do we reduce work in progress? And we said, okay, well, how about we eliminate this quarterly release? You know, how can we do that in a way that's you know incremental, but is also showing progress over time? And so what we're working on now is, you know, instead of waiting until the end of that three month period to release all the features as we call epics, um, how can we release more streamlined and in the actual sprints? So after each sprint, if a feature is ready, can we release to production? You know, maybe we, we feature flag it um, using tooling and then release to a subset of customers. Or if it's ready for prime time, how do we just release that to the core code base? And so these are the problems we're trying to figure out as an organization because these are, you know, what I would call the next steps to a modern CIC pipeline is releasing extremely fast. And once you have that app release and there's two different releases, right? And so this would be a bit of a tangent. This is important to note because it's not just you can say, okay, I'm going to go follow an Etsy like pipeline, you know, day one where I can release every day. There's two types of releases you have to remember. You have your app releases. This is the hot, you know, the big UI UX changes, the big platform level changes. And you also have your minor fixes. This could be schema changes. This could be um, changes to you know, UI, maybe small bugs that are caught. Um, what's important in an organization is to understand what buckets you have and what can you release quickly um, and more iteratively. So for us, we want to maybe decrease a one week hop HF for these small bugs to a daily, maybe hourly. Um, that's the goal, but we still want to have some control on the large platform features that might just be more, need more time to bake. You know, these are big items that are being pushed out, um, but we also do want to remember that we are releasing iteratively and with an MVP in mind of getting out after each sprint. So. Okay, great. Um, good overview. I wonder um, if you could walk through um, some of the key, key milestones or, or key challenges that you guys have undergone. And, and was there something that you did first, I guess, when yeah. we really started on this? Yeah, I mean, there's been, I think there's three core challenges that any organization, you know, we're still learning a lot, um, but I think just by initiating these conversations, there's challenges that come up. Um, and I, I have a list here, but I have three biggest challenges that will come up is around the process, the people and the culture and the technology. Um, these are, to me represent the biggest hurdles to get over, you know, the process, you know, if you've had this culture of a quarter release moving to a, you know, bi-weekly, this is a cross, you know, this, this requires cross-functional engagement. If your marketing teams were engaged before, if your SaaS ops or your, you know, your um, team that releases software or even your customer support and success, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to be responding to bugs. So this takes a big cross-functional movement to get in place um, to do well, because if not, no one's going to be ready because they've been used to a slower model. And so this takes a big effort from the entire team driven from, you know, the PM and engineering to evangelize this concept. Um, next on the, the people side. So when you're doing this, you really have to understand, you know, where do you want to start? This kind of effort for us, we best, we, we came to the realization, we should start small. How do we start with one organization or one product line in this case? Um, and then spread outwards because the best way to evangelize a concept is to show results and then, you know, um, move outwards. And so that's, Another hurdle for us, and that's you know, actually one that's been easiest to resolve because it does show results. You know, we can start developing more iteratively and cutting down that work in progress. And no one likes a high work in progress. Um, and lastly, technology. And I would say this is one that's just, you know, par for the course. You know, when you're transitioning to such a new process, there's going to have to be, you know, a rip and replace of old technology that wasn't meeting your standards, um, additions of new technologies that are required. Um, and for us, we had to add in several technologies. So you know, we wanted to have this really robust feature flagging process. Um, so how do you do that? And how do I control the, you know, the features that go as a product manager? And so we purchased a tool called LaunchDarkly to do this for us. And there I can manage, you know, which features get pushed out to customers. If I want to run a beta test, or maybe I want to do A-B testing to test different variants of an application or, you know, widget location. Um, I can do that all in that tooling. Um, and on top of that, and we, we've added some additional monitoring tools to catch uh, stack, trace, stack trace errors, or if things go wrong during the development or build process, we can catch those much faster now rather than having customers report them to us. So I would say you know, process, people, and technology are the biggest hurdles any organization will have to face. Yeah, got it. And, and the, the tools are um, important, 
And so can you maybe tell me a little bit about um, how many new tools did we need to acquire? Mm. How did you guys select those? Because there's so many to choose from. Yep. Um, what was that process? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's several tools we've come across, you know, so that there's, there's, there's a couple of components. So if you look at a standard pipeline, a CSV pipeline, you'll have the build, the test, the deploy, the monitor. Um, and so each one of those requires for us its own set of tooling. And so in our primary build, we'll, we'll send it to the GitHub or our internal Git repository. That stayed the same. But after that, has had some changes. You know, how do we push to our build um, pipeline or automation pipeline? So pushing to a Jenkins-like system, that's changed. Then after that, how do we monitor that the build was successful and it got push successful? Um, so we're looking at tools, the one called Sentry. Um, this provides some good insight into stack tracing that we're using now as part of the build process. And then the deploy stage, which is what I'm really interested in as a product manager, um, this is where we're looking at a tool like LaunchDarkly. And you know, our primary criteria for evaluating a tool like this is that it had to be self-service. You know, that was a big thing for us. You know, I didn't want to engage a large sales cycle. It had to be easy, easy to use and it had to be robust enough to segment across different environments. So many modern applications will have a dev environment where your dev team works, that's where they push changes on a daily basis. You'll have a staging environment. That's where you know things that are almost ready for prime time will go to staging to test and a lot of production. Um, and so it had to be robust enough to segment the productions like that. Um, and on top of that, it had to be able to segment the different clients. So OpsRamp's tenancy is built in such a way that we have these partners, which are these higher level tenants, and then you have the clients underneath. Um, and so as a product manager, I want to be able to say, this feature is only needed for this partner or this client under the partner. And so having that flexibility was a huge key for us to roll out features successfully. Um, and on top of that, be able to hook into our Pendo tooling to track user engagement. So if I do roll out a feature, I can easily test from launch dates, are people adopting it? Are, is the segment I'm targeting um, being, you know, getting traction? Are they seeing any drop-offs, certain page clicks? So, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of criteria, and, you know, thankfully launched directly, uh, satisfied for, you know, satisfied those requirements for us when we uh, got signed up. Good. Were there any issues with the tools in terms of um, getting them, you know, adoption or, or, you know, developers and engineers can be very opinionated about what they use and ha have there been any you know kind of issues with shadow tooling like i'm not going to use that i'm going to use something else and we do have uh people a large team in india that might be using different tools i'm just wondering how have there been conflicts there yeah this is actually a great this is actually some funny stories that came out of this so um we've had our definitely our troubles i wouldn't say troubles but we've had some questions come up by rolling out this tooling, but we try to be as transparent as possible and the whole team's on the same page. But, you know, whenever you roll a new tool like this in an organization that's so new, so fresh, everyone wants access. And, you know, something they launched darkly, it's, it's priced per user. And so, you know, we started out, I think our initial bill was only, you know, we had $200 a month. And by the end of the first three week period, I think we ran up to $1,300 per month because so many users wanted access. <laughs> and yeah. so we had to cut back that, of course. And so, um, you know, people always want to, you know, engineers, importantly, they want to test things for themselves. They want to get in there. They want to see how it works. And so that was kind of funny. So we had to, I had to reduce the spend so my accounting, our accounting team doesn't get too mad at me. Um, so that was a big one. And then some other tooling that's more tangential, but as a part of the deploy process, you want to get feedback. And so we're looking at a tool right now to gather feedback um, or, you know, in general, RFEs, how do you get RFEs in the product? And rolling that out, we actually, uh, uh, we turned it on momentarily for one production customer and they saw it and they actually, they submitted a request to disable the ability to submit requests. So I thought <laughs> that was kind of funny and uh, the team got a laugh out of that. But uh, yeah, it, it gives you some insight into you know, how people want to submit feedback and not everyone's the same. So we, we took that into consideration for the next coming uh, releases. Yeah, very good. You know, one of the things that I hear a lot about um, in, in these transitions to DevOps, Agile, CICD, they're all kind of linked mm -hmm. together, is that um, um, it, the hardest part is, is getting people from these different teams to work together differently mm -hmm. than they did before. And certainly tooling is helpful, but that's really not the, the, the full answer, right? So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, again, like you might have a story or, or what's been your experience with that? Has it been as hard as people say it is? And if so, you know, how do you kind of work on that? Um, yeah, this is this is a really big one. I think this goes, this goes into my earlier point where the people is a big part of the transition and also the process. You know, I'm a big believer that, you know, change, the, 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 
the best change you can do for an organization is usually not the easiest to make, and it usually has to become the most abruptly. Um, and so we've rolled this out, you know, pretty forthcoming, and we want to get this out because we understand the value it can drive not only for our organization but for our users. And so once you kind of put it in that light that this isn't just a process change to make the certain lives of a team and the company easier, it's really for the, our end users, right? Because the result is that end users get, you know, better products faster and more uh, and more consistently. And so when you put it in that light, you know, I think people's angst drop a little bit and it comes more of how do we solve this um, given our existing tooling and then how do we migrate to this new process? Because it is new. And anytime you introduce newness to an engineering organization, um, you have to be careful because there's so many pipelines, so many processes that have been you know, built out over the years, either through native knowledge or that have been documented. And when you're kind of flipping those on their heads, um, you got to be careful that you don't disrupt any existing workflows that might impact customers because that's what we'd want to avoid in the end. So, yeah, and for us, like I mentioned earlier, you know, how do we get there easily? It's about starting small. Um, and I'm a big believer. Start small, expand outwards. You know, it's kind of the classic agile methodology with iterating. Um, if we can show value in a certain product line and make sure that works really stable there, we can then evangelize much easier and show how we standardize the process how we overcame certain challenges, you know, in, in some sense, have a guinea pig. <laughs> and for better or worse, that's really what it means. Um, but it's not a bad thing. It, it means that your company and culture is ready for the change. They just want to obviously learn from it before you roll out full scale, which makes sense. You know, it's basically a canary rollout for a new process. Yeah, got it. Um, I wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, as we've progressed in the CI CD journey and, how has um, the build pipeline changed you know, regarding mm -hmm. code yep. commits, automation? You know, go into that a little bit. How does that look? Yeah, this is big for us. This is this is really big. So automation testing, I think, is the core of having a really streamlined build process. And so the biggest piece that's changed for us now is that all features, before they're committed by engineering, before any developer starts working on them, have to have a rigorous test case built for them. And so the PM will sit down with the engineer and say, okay, here are the five key flows that I need to be automated. If it's for dashboards, you know, it's creating a widget, selecting metric, creating a visualization type, all of that needs to have a script written for it so that when we do push this out, if there's any issues with these key flows, we can easily detect those. Um, and so having these as part of the core code base instead of as, you know, as an afterthought during QA has been greatly successful. You know, that way when we do release when users are using these, we can immediately detect when things go wrong and not worry about users are telling us themselves. Um, so that's been one of the major changes. Um, and secondly, it's probably the monitoring side. And as a monitoring company, we do want to monitor things. And so it's a bit of a drinking our own champagne. Um, so using how can we use OpsRamp more effectively to monitor our own production workloads, you know, in, in Kubernetes or even on the app side. And so that's why I mentioned the Sentry as a good way to mention, you know, to profile stack traces and headers. Um, and I'll be using OpsRamp's native monitoring. So we are releasing some features around Kubernetes app monitoring and most of our production workloads are running Kubernetes now. And so we are using that more heavily to monitor our, monitor our Kafka streaming services, our Cassandra databases, um, and other applications in Kubernetes. So that's been greatly successful as well because instead of someone, you know, reaching out to your native guru on the SaaS ops side or let's say your deployment team, um, you can have that uh, power as a developer. You know, that's when you go to DevOps to see actually how is my production workloads running that I just pushed to production um, and, and, and option, right? So that, that's a huge benefit to the entire team to have confidence in their own application they're pushing out. Yeah, got it. A very different mindset, right? Um, to, to get that constant feedback as you're going. And Absolutely. I'm wondering if there's challenges with that as a developer, if you're used to just kind of heads down and, and just, you know, rip out your features and your code and, and enjoy that process, but having to stop and do these checks. And, and is that something that um, I don't really know because I'm not a developer, but is that a hard thing for a lot of our people? I mean, I know, you yeah, know, we have yeah. a, a lot of young developers that maybe don't want to work that way. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great point. Um, I would say it's, it's not something that's difficult. It's more of just, you know, there's a mindset that developers just develop all day and then they push things over the wall. And they say, okay, QA, go test. Um, that mindset is really, you know, in my opinion, really backwards. You know, QA and development should happen in the same pipeline. You know, either you have a dedicated QA working with the developer or the developer should just have QA test cases written into the code 
which is what I was mentioning before with the automation tests. And so I would actually say developers really like it because now instead of a QA developer engineer, you know, knocking at their doorstep, you know, every time their sprint ends, they have confidence that when they give it to that team to test, oh, they've already covered 90% of all issues that could go wrong. There's still going to be some back and forth. Maybe there's some issues they didn't find, um, but they can feel much more confident that the code they're releasing is what's going to meet user expectations and provide stability in the platform. Uh, but on top of that, you know, deploying side, this is actually something we're still working on, is how do we get developers more comfortable with production, uh, with, with publishing and uh, pushing their own production code? Because that's, to me, the next step of DevOps. Um, it's not something I think all dev teams should start with initially. It should be a slower thing because, you know, that's a different skill set to learn is that ability to push out software. And that's where the trust goes into your automation testing, especially when you're talking about app releases. Um, you know, like I mentioned, there's two types of releases generally, your app releases, which are your general software releases, and then your smaller bug fixes. When you get to the larger app releases, that's something I think will always take a little more handholding uh, from the entire team to get out the wall. But on the bug fix side, on the smaller release side, you know, how can we get a single developer pushing those automatically without having to go through a third party? And so that requires the monitoring, you know, both the Sentry and OpsRamp itself, and also yeah. the proper QA and automation tests. Yeah, so automation is, is super important, you know, safe automation, I guess, which is something that we talk about in our own product too, and it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I guess, um, you know, one last question here before we get into our Q&A segment, and that is, can you uh, sort of um, summarize lessons learned so far? Actually, first tell us where we are in our journey, what else mm -hmm. needs to be done? And I know that's a, a quote unquote, the journey that never ends, but where we are, and then um, what are maybe two or three lessons that you think would be helpful to others? Yeah, uh, so where we are today, um, so we'll be finishing out the last quarterly release cycle with our 8.0 release. That's what's gonna be releasing to our customers um, starting this, this month. So mid this month, we're rolling out the last quarterly release cycle that we're gonna be doing for the entire product. Post that, we'll, we'll be starting the transition to the um, releasing after each sprint model or you know true agile or CI, you know using all the CICD process I mentioned before. And so that will be starting with the discovery and monitoring product. That's what I mentioned, you know, starting small. And so that's the product line that I primarily run. And so we'll be using that as the vehicle to test all these new processes. Uh, since there's a lot of new features coming out as well, and the customers can read about those coming soon, um, it's a great op opportunity to test that, that process. And so our goal is that by our next release, which is going to come Q1 um, next year, well, that's when the next quarterly release is supposed to come, we want to have built out the entire process that all product lines, you know, discovery and monitoring, event incident management, and remediation automation can follow the same process. And if we really move away from the quarterly release model for all product lines and all releases, and then we can then move to the daily bug fixes uh, or even hourly, you know, some of our engineers even want to do um, on the minutes and how can we release when things are ready? If it's ready now, push it, don't wait to the hour. And so that's our goal for, you know, both the app releases and the, the smaller bug releases. Got it. Got it. Uh, any parting words of advice? Um, yeah, um, I would say the biggest thing to remember when you're going through this kind of transition is have sympathy and some empathy for the users. Um, no, excuse me, have, if you're, if your internal team, you know, this is a big transition and breaking a lot of existing workflows they might have. And it, it can be a little scary because some people might not be comfortable with this kind of thing. It's a lot of change taken at once. Um, but understand that there is a lot of value to doing it. You know, like I mentioned, for not, for not just you, but also your your customers. Um, and lastly, you know, you really these processes aren't just here because they're marketing buzz or because you know people like talking about them. You know, I've seen a lot of tangible value already from doing this. Um, your whole product team will feel more enabled. This will be a great culture kind of change if you're stuck on the old model because you know once you can release features. I think we lost your audio there for a sec. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now I can hear you again. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, all I was saying was this process <laughs> is, is proven to work. And I would say don't be afraid to start. Um, that's the biggest key. Um, but just remember to start small. And if you are worried about starting small, um, find that one piece of your organization or one piece of your product that you can test this process on and just try there. Um, you, don't, you don't have to go full out and revolutionize your entire product line with this process in one day. Um, those are probably my two parting words. Yeah, great. Okay, so we're going to um, uh, go into Q&A here. So if you have not been able to 
um, submit a question now. Uh, please, this is your opportunity to do so. We'll have uh, a few minutes for that. So allow uh, Michael to grab a little sip of water. Cool. All right. I do have one question. Um, somebody asked, you know, we have a, a global team and we have people in a totally different time zone in India. And, and so I'm wondering if this process, which requires such heavy collaboration, working differently, has it been more challenging with having that kind of a um, disparate dev team or actually has it been more helpful because we have sort of 24 seven, you know, teams in, in a way? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question. Um, I, I would say now it's not so much of an issue. I mean, the whole te uh, entire world is working remotely. Um, the issue hasn't been the time zones or the, you know, the people or, you know, the, or the different locations. I would say it's just still the process. You know, there's going to be different processes running in the India team um, that they have to get broken. And we have a lot of those people that have been here for, for a long time, right? Since the beginning of OpsRamp, um, it can take some convincing to show the value. So I wouldn't say it's been so much of an issue across the time zones. It's more of just, you know, how do you convince people so far away that this is the proper thing? Because I've never met half the people that we're, we're trying to get this process in place for. And so it takes a lot of just, you know, I would say negotiation, but you really have to put on your your convincing hat to sometimes get get it down people's uh, minds that this is the right way forward. And we've, we've, we've done that. So any kind of barriers on that side have been, completely removed and they were kind of removed in the first two weeks of announcing this kind of change. So, um, yeah, that's my answer, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's good. That's good. Um, let's see. I had another question that just came in. How can cross-functional teams, um, help the CI CD transformation? And maybe part of that would be like, did we have to create new cross-functional teams? Yeah, this is a big one. Um, having, you know, Obviously, a big part of this process is the technology. It's getting the process in place to get the technology out faster, you mean the product. But a big part, like I mentioned earlier, is how does the team that's required to support the product, you know, you have your go-to-market teams, your marketing, your support, even sales. It's gonna be a big transition. Um, I would say what I've done in the past is how can we, um, as a product team or an engineer, engineer organization, provide some structured checklist, and this is something we're rolling out too. So for each sprint cycle, let's say we're introducing 10 new features or five new features even, um, we should have some sort of structured checklist for that to make sure that support's been trained um, to get the, you know, how, what are the common gotchas for the features? How can marketing know the new value propositions we're delivering, you know, marketing and sales? And then how can, you know, the engineering team understand what's being pushed out? So we have this kind of structured process checklist in place now, and that's been able to resolve kind of any cross-functional issues um, to make sure that the entire company is up to date um, because it's, not, it's much faster now. Um, and people, you know, we try to also make it known, this is something we're rolling out too, in our own Slack channels. You know, in, your, in the product, we have a dedicated mm -hmm. product Slack channel. Um, we'll be posting updates that we pushed out the weekly basis. So, you know, people have more reason to check Slack now, you know, if there wasn't one before, <laughs> so. Right. Uh, other than the random <laughs> channel and stuff like that, the jokes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's really great because it is helpful, I think, for everybody, um, especially at a younger company like ours, um, smaller company, to understand the product. And so by involving more people in those discussions or those decisions, I think it kind of helps everybody, just from my perspective, anyway. But um, very good. So, uh, listen, thanks so much. Uh, I wanted to make sure that. Uh, People still on the call today can get more information about our upcoming events. We have, uh, please go to our website and check out our event page. Also, here's our various socials. The on-demand recording of this will be available very soon on our website. You can check that out if you were not able to, if you had to jump out early, I guess if you jumped out early, you wouldn't be here anyway, right? Anyway, um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, great to talk to you, Michael, and um, have a great day. Yeah, thank you.